Hi, this is Ted Dintersmith. I produced the film Most Likely to Succeed and wrote the book What School Could Be. But I'm particularly enthusiastic for all of the amazing progress taking place across the islands of Hawaii and the great work of my dear friend Josh Rapoon. A few years ago, Josh connected me to the remarkable community in Hana and a program I think that epitomizes the very best of what education could be, Hana Build. And through my time there, I had a chance to meet and spend time with Rick Rutiz, the founder, and Lapoa Kahalehuahi. You're about to hear from Lapoa. Fasten your seatbelt. This will be a fabulous podcast interview. This conversation will shift the way you think about school and what's possible in communities like Hana, but communities all across the country and around the world. Stay tuned. Thanks. This podcast is funded by Ted Dintersmith, the executive producer of the acclaimed film Most Likely to Succeed, and the author of the best selling book What School Could Be. Seeing the world from that point of view of, you know, you're just seeing it like you're in a vacuum, right? You're seeing it. I mean, there's movement around you, but you're looking out of this puka, this hole at the end of this wave, whether it's far or close, right? I mean, that's going to dictate not only your perspective, but then your movement. Are you going to have to pick up as well and, and stay in time with the wave so that you can make it out? Or are you going to have to slow down so you can prolong that moment and enjoy it for as long as as you can. I mean, that's taken me, you know, that, that particular moment, I mean, is, is one of my favorite moments in the world, my favorite feelings in the world. This is Josh Rapoon, and you are listening to the What School Could Be podcast. Before we start the show, please consider joining the rapidly growing What School Could Be global online community. Simply install the What School Could Be app on your smart device or go to community.whatschoolcouldbe.org. I look forward to seeing you there. Today, my guest is Lipoa Kahale Uahi, the executive director of Makahana Kaike, also known as Hana Build. In this conversation, Lipoa and I range widely over a number of topics, including the remarkable way her life is a literal representation of the phrase, it takes a village. Long before Lipoa went off to college at University of California at Santa Barbara, she had become a mature human, very self-aware that she'd been raised by the people of her Hana community, raised by the ocean and the land, by her passion for surfing and participation in community theater productions, and by her love of the ancient form of dance in Hawaii called the hula. Today, Lipoa is the executive director of Makahana Kaike, an award-winning vocational training program for K-12 youth in Hana, Maui, her home community. Over two-thirds of Hana's population is of Native Hawaiian ancestry. Makahana Kaike's approach is to teach academic subjects through real-life, hands-on application, where students can understand the concepts they're learning through tangible examples. Their projects meet real school and community needs, meaning students' education immediately serves those whose lives it touches. Lipoa is a graduate of Hana Elementary and High School. In addition to her BA in Global Studies from UC Santa Barbara, where she was a Gates Millennium Scholar, she earned a master's in special education from Chaminade University. At UC Santa Barbara, Lipoa helped lead the university's A-team to a National Scholastic Surfing Association's Collegiate Championship. She has surfed competitively in New Zealand and other locations in South Asia, and was the subject of a landmark surfing documentary titled, Hana Surf Girls. In 2019, Rick Rutiz stepped down as the executive director of Makahana Kaike after 19 years building the program. At Rick's direction, Lipoa took the tiller and began guiding the program into its next iteration, though a global pandemic loomed like a great storm on the near horizon. Rick Rutiz said the following about Lipoa, and I quote, Lipoa has achieved so much in her life already. World-class surfer, lifelong hula dancer, Gates scholar, master's degree in education, 
She's lived internationally among other cultures. She could have chosen any life path she wanted. But when, one day out surfing the waves at Hamoa, I asked her what's next, she told me she wanted to make a difference here in Hana, the community where she's from. So I said, you're hired. She asked me what the job was and I told her, I don't know yet. We just want you. It was the best decision Makahana Ka'ike ever made. And now, here's my conversation with Lipoa Kahale Uahi. Lipoa, welcome to the What School Could Be podcast. Mahalo Nui for having me. So, Lipoa, I've been thinking a lot lately, maybe even more than normal, about the purpose of school and where, quote, school happens. So it appears true that in your life, the whole world and everything in it served as your school, your place of learning. So I want to ask about this a bit, okay? So we use the phrase, it takes a village so much it becomes almost cliche. But in fact, it can be traced back to West African cultures. In 1981, celebrated author Toni Morrison articulated it well when she said, I don't think one parent can raise a child. I don't think two parents can raise a child. You really need the whole village. So you told me, Mm -hmm. Lapoa, that in your case, the phrase is literally true. So for example, you told me about an uncle who participated in your raising by working with your mom to grow food for the family. So what is that story? And in what ways did your uncle represent the village in all of its complexity? Mm, Mahalo for that question and starting off in that way. (laughs) That story that came to me, my mom shared that with me later in life. I forget when, but you know, it could have been when I was in college or even post-college where she was reflecting on that time in our lives as a family and the challenges that we, but also she was experiencing to put food on the table. And so it was incredibly moving, but more so than that, it then reshaped the world around me, the way that I interpreted, you know, it gave depth to that time. As a child, having seen only so much, you know, that part shaped your perspective moving forward. And then hearing her add a layer to it, you know, provided more depth and insight. And so that uncle was actually, you know, I'm sure we're related, (laughs) (laughs) but he wasn't you know, my first, second or third uncle, which as you know, in in Hawaiian cultures, you know, we do call aunties and uncles, those that, you know, may not be related to us by blood, right? but, you know, whom we we know, we see, and may or may not have um, impacted our lives in in the ways that we know it. So, Mm. but but I do believe we are related, but several times, you know, removed. And so I just share that too, to I think add, add another layer to the fact that this person influenced my life without having to be, you know, someone that I saw whenever I went to family gatherings. You know, I really only saw him as he worked with my mom. And he was a very, you know, soft-spoken, but also very, a man of a few words. And the way that he gave was the way that he knew how. He had a great green thumb and he's only currently passed. Mm. And so this story has continued to, you know, influence the way that I, that I've seen him, even though we have, you know, don't have long conversations. It was incredibly touching that he, he saw how hard my mom worked and works. And she, she worked on a flower farm, a tropical flower farm Mm. here in Hana. And she did that. She's done that type of work my entire life with various farms throughout our town. And in this one in particular, was really the one that I was raised at, me and my siblings. And he saw how hard she worked. He knew of the struggles that she was experiencing in a household of of domestic violence and drug abuse. Mm. And through, you know, he witnessed her and us as my parents went through a divorce later in my teens. And that was the way he could help us Mm. was just plant things without any provocation no no communication to or request to do so that's just how he gave he planted squash and pumpkin and eggplant and whatever you know sweet potato and and it's a 
particularly rocky area. And so those are the types of things that he knew would do well there. And mm. they did. Mm. Yeah, that's a that's an awesome story. You know, I I've reached a point in my life, and by the way, I'm I'm noting for our listeners that we're recording this conversation the day after Mother's Day, which is particularly cool <laughs> since we're talking about your your mom and the way that she added layers to the story long after the stories had already, you know, were already over already or had had happened already. But I think it's a very cool idea, this it takes a village. And, you know, I think about in my own life that here I am in my sixties now and I've kind of earned a place where many, many, many people call me Uncle Josh. And it's <laughs> it's kind of hilarious, but it's actually a pretty cool thing, you know, that you you earn your way to that through life and through the things that you do. And that in a way kind of helps us to understand, you know, the bigger picture of It Takes a Village and the number of people who are involved in the village. So so kind of along the same lines, in what ways did the beaches and the ocean, before mm. you began your competitive surfing, serve as places of learning? Like how did they become part of the village that raised you, part of the foundation you return to time and again? Well, I always start, even though you know it did start within my family before I was born. But for me, it starts with my name. Mm. My father named me Lipo after a type of limu here in Hawaii. Mm. And it has to be in the ocean in order mm. in order to thrive. It has to be actually submerged. <laughs> and so that for me, I I always, yeah, I always come back to that source, to that pico, you know, and and he's questioned me in various times of my life where are you? You know, I was trying to call you and, you know, or why didn't you get here at this time? You know, and I'm like, I was in the water, right? you know, and, and eventually, you know, I'd always te I'd tease him and I still do at times whenever he's kind of questioning me, why did you do this first? You know? <laughs> mm. And I'm like, well, I, I went to check the waves, you know, I'm, I'm on my way, but I, I went to check the ocean and because you named me, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you named me this, you raised me this way. Not that it's your fault, but this is what I've become. Mm -hmm. And so that really is the source for me. And, you know, fortunately being able to be raised down in an area that is is a coastal village within the village of Hana. And so I, I constantly ran, literally sometimes, <laughs> mm -hmm. to the sea, to, you know, the places that I feel were there for, for my becoming through various stages of my life. Mm. And often, you know, while there were definitely people, I mean, my loved ones and, and those aunties and uncles that supported you in the village and helped raise you, the particular places that I ran to, the beaches that I ran to, did that also. And I feel very fortunate that that's a part of my life. And whenever my dad would pick me up from the airport, from wherever I what had been, whether from college or other travels, he would always take me to our home break mm -hmm. of Hamoa. Mm -hmm. And no matter what time, you know, whether he, we got home to Hana at night, you know, and the stars are out and the moon is out, he'd always go there first. Before going home, he would always stop there first and wake me up. And, and that was, that was my Oftentimes, our homecoming together mm. was going to to those places. So mm. it's definitely been, yeah, part of my my upbringing and becoming. Yeah, that's really cool. I I feel very aligned with that story because at some point in my life, I began to realize that it wasn't just the people in my life who were the village that were raising me. It was actually the physical environment and everything mm. that was happening in that environment. And you know, I was raised on Kaneohe Bay on the on the windward side of Oahu. And that was really where most of my learning happened, you know, outside of school. So I think that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's like super interesting to think about how people come to that consciousness that there's more than just humans in your life that are helping to make you and help, you know, mentor you and guide you and, and coach you into becoming, you know, who you are. And so, you know, kind of along the same lines, I had a conversation on this podcast with an educator who talked about the ways hula, which is an ancient form of Hawaiian mm -hmm. dance how it teaches you as you learn in its forms. And so in what ways did hula, this Hawaiian form of dance, represent It Takes a Village in your life?
growing up in a, a small in a small village, <laughs> small and isolated village, there were a handful of Kumu that resided here and taught, and they did so for for a couple of generations, and and so you had these these multiple generations that had been taught by those Kumu, and and that are were known and are still known, you know, their names still resonate and people still remember their style and, and mm. their, and their ways and their impact here. And Hula provided me an inlet to my culture in a way that surfing had always done, but I, I only, I learned that kind of later. Mm-hmm. <laughs> my learning in that was a little more prolonged, but with Hula, it it was just such an intimate introduction into our in the Hawaiian mindset and mm. the Hawaiian way of knowing mm. and looking at things in just such a different way, looking at resources, but as having a relationship with those resources. Mm. And some of the earliest memories that I have is not only, of course, harvesting things for lay, but tending those plants mm. or those things in nature. And that exchange, you know, that sure, we might only take what we need, but that's still taking. And and so being able to give back as well mm. and, and tend those places and go back consistently. And so creating that practice. And that's also along with the oli and the mele. I, you know, didn't grow up learning Hawaiian in my household, but of course, my father being the one from Hawaii and from Hana with, you know, genealogical ties here, he knew a lot more than, you know, he would say. He knew a lot more than, you know, especially in mele as well in songs than, you know, but he didn't grow up in any formal, you know, learning Hawaiian in any formal way either. Mm. But hula as well was that that way of of learning our language through olis and chants. Mm. Yeah. So it was incredibly impactful. I, I do feel fortunate as well to have been taught by various kumu, both here in Hana, as well as in other places that I've lived. And it's always provided me an inlet into not only our overall Hawaiian perspective, but the perspectives of of those places. Mm. I love the idea that as you were growing up, and as you were coming in contact with these kumu, and for our listeners who are outside of Hawaii, that means teacher, that these individuals were connecting you to the physical environment and and those resources. And maybe hula is unique amongst world dances in the sense that there are so many parts to it in terms of like physical things that you wear, the lei, the costume, if you will, that you wear. This is drawn from the natural environment. It's part of the process of becoming a dancer, right? And that these individuals Mm -hmm. were helping you to figure that out, which means they were part of that village that were raising you, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. So again, along the same lines, when one is part of a theater production, as you were, one is (laughs) part of a village of sorts, right? So in what ways did this theater village raise you, uplift you, mentor you, teach you, and build your foundation, Lipo? It's funny to reflect because I realize, I mean, and I've realized this over time too, but even just in this, you know, you, you, in reflection, you always might learn something a little bit different or, or see something a little bit different. And so it is funny to see all of these, you know, different schools of thought, right? Mm-hmm. Reflecting on these different schools of thought that I've been able to experience. And that's our, you know, that's only, let's say, in the span of time in, you know, middle and high school and just realizing how much I was able to be exposed to, you know, I think the things that were being offered in HANA at that time, the things that my mom encouraged and and sometimes forced me to do and how I was grateful for that later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But theater was, oh gosh. And I I need to credit our, our theater kumo or teacher at that time. And the other, the others that, were a part of that work at that time because it it was you know it wasn't just not to diminish you know any other like the plays that 
<laughs> that are definitely out there that teach, you know, teach skills and knowledge of yeah. theater. But but she she chose plays and scripts that were extremely complex mm. and things that, you know, people that ended up coming and watching that, I mean, both lived in Hana as, but also those that came from elsewhere were like, wow, like you <laughs> did that with them. And they're like 12, you know, we're like, I, I forget how young my sister was when she was, you know, doing some of the first plays, but they were babies. Mm. And, and I must've been 11, 12. And, and we were just being exposed to, again, just a different, you know, a different mindset, different ways of thinking, different mm. ways of, of expressing oneself, needing to memorize these lines and, and deliver. I mean, everything that just came in was involved from the practices, the long practices, mm. and then, you know, leading jump shooting all the way to, to production and, and how our parents showed up and, and put things on and created the set. And, you know, just that level of involvement that we were all a part of. I mean, that was a village. And that, I think, prepped me to accept that there was immense difference in our world, different, mm. different ways of speaking, different... You know, I mean, and we're we're dressed. You know, I'm I'm just recalling some of our the first memories of some of our first plays. You know, we're dressed as bugs, and <laughs> and so just thinking about how I mean, just, but the the costumes were incredible. I mean, it was called the Butterfly's Evil Spell, mm. and I'm not one to remember. You know, the the playwright and and all of the the kind of logistics to it. But and and so I feel a little embarrassed bringing it up, but. We were we were all bugs, and the costumes were just immaculate and incredible, and everything was created by our, our teachers and our parents. <laughs> mm. And we did it, you know, in an outdoor environment, actually at our our hotel, our one and only hotel here, and on the grounds there, mm. and you know, under a starry night and lights and makeup, and <laughs> wow. it, it's it wow. was quite incredible I, I think you know kind of I mean blew us all away to be mm. a part of something like that <laughs> mm. wow the world and all of its complexity emerging yeah <laughs> as you're young yes right right and so even on top of that as if our listeners you know aren't already getting a sense for how the world was really your village and that it was raising you you were a competitive surfer and you were featured in a bison films Russ Spencer documentary titled Hana Surf Girls. And in a previous episode, I spoke with an elementary school principal about the idea of, quote, reading the world, which we talked about in terms of different types of literacy, like there's reading a book, and then there is reading the world. And I want to talk about the idea of mm -hmm. reading a wave. So what does that mean, <laughs> Lipoan? Like, in what ways did the waves you surfed professionally act as the village that raised and shaped you? and helped you learn how to read the world from reading the wave to mm. reading the world. I had a wonderful mentor who I, I still do. She's still one of my mentors, but you know how you go from, you know, if, if you're lucky, I feel like you're, you're able to go from having mentors and teachers to having lifelong friends. And, and this particular mentor I feel like has become a lifelong friend mm. as well. Yeah. As a as a continued mentor, <laughs> I don't think she'll ever not be a mentor to me. But she first became a mentor as I was preparing to write my college essay, my you know college entrance essay, mm -hmm. my personal statement. And through a quite rigorous process, we came to identifying just what you're talking about: reading a wave and and the particular moment when you're in the barrel of a wave. Mm -hmm. And it took me a little bit of time to be able to read the wave in such a way that I could get barreled. Mm -hmm. And and for some it might be easier. <laughs> mm -hmm. But recognizing, you know, and identifying that part of the, you know, that moment as the entrance to this essay. And that you're not only selecting the wave that might give you this particular special moment 
But then you're also riding it in such a way that you're waiting, you're waiting for the lip of the wave or the top of the wave to look just right. <laughs> mm, right. And then you're positioning yourself, whether it be recognizing your speed and having to slow down or speed up to mm. meet the lip of that wave at just the right moment and positioning yourself. So either sticking your hand in the wave to slow yourself down or pumping, you know, using your knees and your legs and moving on the board in such a way that will pick up your speed and then embracing it, mm. you know, embracing the lip, covering your body or breaking over your body mm. and enjoying, you know, having to slow, like just slow yourself down in such a way that, and not physically, but mentally to enjoy that, seeing the world from that point of view of, you know, you're just seeing it like you're in a vacuum, right? You're seeing it. I mean, there's movement around you, but you're looking out of this puka, this hole at the end of this wave, whether it's far or close, <laughs> right? I mean, right. that's going to dictate not only your perspective, but then your movement. Are you going to have to pick up as well and, and stay in time with the wave so that you can make it out? Or mm. are you going to have to slow down so you can prolong that moment and enjoy it for as long as you can? Wow. I mean, that's taking me, you know, that, that particular moment I mean, is is one of my favorite moments in the world, my mm. favorite feelings in the world. But just that, I mean, being able to have written that in an essay, mm. you know, at, at such a milestone moment in anyone's life to realize at that time, that was my perspective, given the experiences that I'd had so far, but especially this help to realize that, <laughs> mm -hmm. to realize that I had experience enough to go out into the world was incredibly, you know, impactful. And I, I think one of the first instances of many that I was able to do that. And mm -hmm. so that's how, mm -hmm. you know, riding a wave and one experience of riding a wave, how that shaped who I am and how I view the world. Wow. I can just imagine, Nepal, that I'm, <laughs> I'm the admissions officer at University of California, Santa Barbara, reading this <laughs> essay and going, Okay, this is a person who's, you know, in education, we talk about transferable skills and the, and the skills that you're talking about there become transferable to the world, to the way that you move through the world. And that's pretty magic. Mm -hmm. And I wonder that that's kind of our North Star as educators is that mm -hmm. we can help kids to become skilled like that, whether it's riding waves or whatever. And wow, that's, that's very, very cool. So, and perfect segue because you really, and this is the last question before we take a break, but you really got me thinking about the idea of slowing down. And your mm. your voice today comes to us from Hana, Maui, a place whose DNA <laughs> is the antithesis of our current age of acceleration and hyper change and speed. Mm. So I wonder, Lepoa, that we are spending so much time hyperventilating over getting kids ready for the speed of change that we miss the directive to help them learn to slow down. And... In what ways is your, quote, it takes a village journey, the story of learning how to pace yourself and what parts of your non-school life best taught you how to slow down and read the world and be engaged with the world? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, even just sitting here, you know, I'm currently just to make sure that I, I received the most secure <laughs> internet connection here in Hana. Right, right. I, I am sitting in my office, which is on the campus of, of Hana School, Hana High and Elementary School. Mm -hmm. And it's funny to, I was thinking about this right before we started, you know, how we in school, in, you know, grade school, there is that feeling, there can be that feeling where you're just trying to speed things up, right? Because you're trying to get out. Yeah. You're trying to, what, you know, whether that's just get out and so I can start working, or whether that's get out and into the world, go to college, whatever that means to each individual, you know, you're just kind of like trying to get out yeah, right. <laughs> and seeing myself here now, you know, and, and some of my colleagues and friends of mine, you know, we, who are here, you know, it's like, oh, now we're back, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. we're here on, on our home campus and, and just tell, you know, we kind of laugh about it, but I, I feel that our, our community is fortunate in ways that our culture is still very present in our day-to-day -day lives. Mm -hmm. And that often requires us to slow down. Mm 
Mm. Whether that's tequila or observe in a practice, right? Through, through fishing or planting, farming, you know, whatever it might be, you know, observing, you have to observe your surroundings. And so you have to, you have to slow down mm. before you cast, you know, the, the fishing net, you have to observe, you have to pause, you have to wait for the right moment. And, and I, I think that's, it's a huge benefit, you know, mm. in our world, in, like you were saying in our world today, that is yeah. constantly telling us to keep, you know, mm. keep going and move faster and, you know, it, it does make me think about how our community has so far staved off development because a, a lot of times that's where my mind goes yeah. when it goes to moving faster and, and outside influence, which isn't a negative thing, yeah. but just sometimes the speed with which it moves has huge negative impacts on the world around it or the people around it, the environment around it. And so we, you know, fortunately, I think our ruralness has prevented most of that but you know it, it's still happening mm -hmm. but our environment and our people you know are, are preserving a culture that at times you know you, if you're watching or listening it requires you to slow down and i think that's what we at least have to go back to yeah that's awesome and speaking of development we'll talk about that in a second but hey everyone Stay with us. We'll be back in a minute with more questions for Lepoa Kahale Uahi. Hey there. Are you interested in hearing weekly conversations with authors, leaders, and practitioners at the forefront of learning and education innovation? Then you'll love the Getting Smart podcast. This podcast amplifies the incredible work being done by some of the most innovative minds in education. Learn new leadership styles, new technologies, new frameworks and mindsets, and get the fuel you need to stay motivated and curious. Together, we can empower all learners to thrive. It's available at gettingsmart.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. Hi, friends. This is Toy Hirschman from Entre Ed. It is my great honor to uplift this excellent podcast, What School Could Be?, as always, we are super excited to support innovation in education. We've been lucky enough to feature some of the incredible What School Could Be educators on our podcast. If you are looking to be inspired by entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial educators and other great minds from across the world, check out the Entre Ed Talk podcast and please like and subscribe and leave a review. Thanks for tuning in. Hey everyone, we're back with Lipoa Kahale Uahi the executive director of Makahana Kaike, an award-winning experiential learning and building program in East Maui. So Lipoa, back in March of 2018, your beloved Hana community got a wake-up call in the form of a buyer who wanted to purchase and potentially develop 46 acres of coastline, which included, as you mentioned before, pasture lands, fishing locations, and much more. And you felt these lands raised you, and you've talked about that already. And you got involved in a struggle to save these lands for Hana. So, Lipo, if education is preparation for life, what prepared yeah. you to contribute, and that's your word, contribute to this struggle? Like, what learning did you bring home with you, for example, from UC Santa Barbara and other places that helped you be ready? for the challenge of saving HANA from development? There are so many that are part of this cause that mm -hmm. have contributed. And, and it's another amazing opportunity to reflect on the last few years since that catalyst moment when so many conversations, so many fears, so many discussions in years prior finally came to a head. Mm. I had sat at tables years before with community members who feared, you know, the next buyer, whether of the hotel or the ranch, which are some of the largest landowners here in Hana and, and have been for a couple of generations now. And, you know, being fortunate that the next buyer didn't do anything major with any of the, particularly the, the coastal land that we're referring to. And, when I think of having the opportunity to go away and return, I did take one grant writing class in, in college at UCSB, mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's it. And a lot of the, the people that I talk to and meet now that work in nonprofits, 
or our executive directors, you know, there's not, we never went to school. You know, it seems like you don't go to school to be a nonprofit director. <laughs> right. You don't. Yeah. <laughs> At least right now. And so I, I, yeah, I didn't go to school and graduate ready, you know, to return and, and expecting to, to step into this role mm-hmm. or even the role with Kale Hali'i and save the Hana Coast. And there were others that were a part of our efforts that were instrumental in, in, writing the grants and obtaining the funds and mm-hmm. running our, our hui that, you know, to reflect on that question causes me to, to reflect. <laughs> but I think it, it definitely gave me the, the confidence and the capacity mm. to attend meetings, to mm. speak up, to toss out, you know, whatever ideas that, that I had after that meeting in 2018 or after that, that kind of community event, I mean, it truly felt like a community event in one of our community venues, you know, Helene Hall, an open space where so many people showed up to help lead that, (laughs) that meeting to be able to, you know, face one's community, all of these things, I feel like I was able to bring back because of the places I had been and the, Mm -hmm. the positions that I had put myself. And so you know, it, it's funny to think like, what were the tangible skills, you know? Mm. But I think all of those skills, I mean, going to college provided me the confidence mm-hmm. to be able to try to host events, to, to bring the community together, to help lead talk stories and meetings and discussions that were really difficult and challenging mm. to help provide sections of, of writing that we could then, you know, put into applications for funding to bring forth perspective and and help others bring forth perspective of these places that, you know, of course we we've been traumatized to hold onto almost in secrecy and, and maybe only provide to our families and, and close loved ones, but needing to learn and try to help ourselves trust the process that, by sharing, we would be able to save these places by sharing our, yeah, both the the difficulties, the challenges, the trauma, but also the beauty of these places was going to be the saving grace. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I was just thinking, you know, that if every school, when you drive on a campus, you see the sign, right? That as you come in, the school's name, and then they always yeah. put a <laughs> phrase or, a, you know, something underneath. And I'm, I'm thinking if every school's phrase was like, building trust, confidence, and capacity. Mm. Wow, you know, that would be amazing. (laughs) And that's really, that's the story is that, you know, you can look at the specific skills and wonder about this writing skill or that listening skill or or whatever it is, but really it all kind of boils down to just confidence and capacity. And that's awesome. You know, that was a something that you contributed to, you got involved in, and then you brought in some confidence and capacity, but then it was grown in you as you went through that process, which is, you know, preparation for whatever the next step is as you move forward. Definitely. So now let's dive into your program, Makahana Kaike, or Hana Builds. Mm -hmm. So you noted early on in this program's story, a saying emerged from you and everybody who is involved in the process. And that saying is, on the outside, we build homes. On the inside, Mm -hmm. we build lives. So here are several questions related to that. So generally speaking, what was happening early in the program's history that resulted in the emergence of this saying, which feels very much like an organic vision and mission statement that arrived after some water had flowed under the bridge? You know what I mean? Definitely. And and this isn't, I mean, it's, it's a part of my story now, having taken on this kuleana and this responsibility and this role and the immense privilege. But it, it's, you know, I wasn't there. Mm. And so these, you know, this impetus and this beginning has been told to me and I, and I feel very connected to it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not mine <laughs> yeah. yep. in the sense that I was there and I, I did it. It's the birth of our organization and our work, which has expanded and which now I'm able to be a part of and, and, and steward. And so I do, I do love this story. And so I I do my best, of course, to, to share it. But our founder, uh, Rick Rutiz was a teacher here in Hana, not from Hana, had varying and amazing life experiences Mm -hmm. on his way to Hana, which is, you know, his home now and which the community he gave so much to. 
but he was a teacher here at Hana School and he was also a general contractor out in our community. So he had those two jobs and those two hats and, and a father as well and husband and bodyboarder. And as we are, right, we are so many things. Mm-hmm. And, and so in his role as, as a teacher, teaching math and, and starting Hana Schools, Hana High School's woodshop class, he saw the students and, and kind of their lackluster and oftentimes defeated defeatedness in in school mm-hmm. but when they entered you know the wood shop there was vigor you know and excitement you know was was kind of reborn and and this wasn't all students but you know the wood shop became a safe haven and a place for a good handful of students to shine and to mm-hmm. show their brilliance where in other areas they were being beaten down by the system. And it's not, you know, again, like I've heard in previous, you know, episodes of your, you know, on your podcast where of course it's not individual teachers. It's not, you know, it's not anyone's fault, (laughs) but we've created this, this system, right. Of education that splits us up into the haves and the have nots and and kind of indicative of society today. (laughs) But the wood shop, you know, we, we all need that, that place where we feel safe and where we feel seen mm-hmm. and honored and invested in. And the wood shop for a handful of students and for all the students that entered it was a safe haven to create and to be brilliant and to shine. Mm-hmm. And Rick noticed that and he started hiring some of his students to be on his crew outside mm. in the community and the jobs that he worked in as a general contractor, wow. you know, building homes or creating things for, for other people in the community yeah. and using his skills as well. You know, he's a master woodworker and extremely intelligent. And so he put those two together and, and it's such a natural way. It's all, it's so amazing. Mm. Like, you know, like you said, it was, it was so natural where he put those two together and, recognized that our students have the capacity to serve their community and serve those in need. You know, sure, there's there's definitely, you know, a, a constant, while slow, slower than some other places, yeah. there is, you know, there is a flow of, of wealthy people. And so there is that work here where you can build and provide and, and make a good living for yourself. But he saw, he coupled that with the other, I think part of the trifecta of Makahana is that, of course, service to community and serving Mm -hmm. those in need. And we are a rural community here. We are two hours away, at least one way, four hours round trip from any nearest hospital or large grocery store where, you know, a lot of our people in need with disabilities or kupuna, you know, need the services to continue thriving. And... You know, so a lot of our kupuna, our elders, you know, will have to go take that drive and and sometimes finish their lives in a hospital or in hospice away from their friends and family Mm -hmm. and their home. And the idea with some of our first projects was born to allow our kupuna, our elders, you know, those with disability to be able to return home as well as to be able to pass here, you know, in their home, surrounded by family and friends and hopefully on their aina or in their, you know, in hana. And so one of our first kupuna hale was built in 2005. And a kupuna hale is, you know, like an ohana unit, a small unit attached to the house that provides, you know, a room or a space for the kupuna, especially in a multi-generational household, which Mm -hmm. we have many here in Hana. Mm -hmm. And so that's the, yeah, again, kind of the trifecta (laughs) of Makahana. Mm, Right. And so, you know, structures are being built by the young people in the program and you have kind of an emerging relationship with Hana Elementary and high schools Mm -hmm. in the beginning, right? And there are probably moments where that relationship was symbiotic and sometimes where the relationship was not symbiotic because, you know, there's an academic mission yes. that those schools have, right? And then along the way, agriculture and the culinary arts come into the picture for Hana Builds. And so all of that is, if I'm understanding it right, it's like a step-by-step process. It's a design process. It's an iterative process where 
Rick and then the staff. And then ultimately when you came on board, you started to just build the thing out slowly, but surely, right? Am I getting that right? (laughs) Correct. Yeah. In 2010, we then, you know, collaborated or connected with another local nonprofit, Kahanu Garden, which is one of the five gardens of the National Tropical Botanical Gardens, Mm -hmm. and to begin our agricultural kind of arm of Makahana Kaike on Mahele Farm. Mm. And so taking that idea of service to community and educating youth and building the next generation of farmers you know, onto a a 10 acre plot that continues to this day and serves produce to Kupuna Mm -hmm. and other community members here in Hana. And then in 2015, we brought on our third arm, which was Malamahaloa. So taking agriculture into a more, you know, Kanaka Hawaiian perspective of farming Kalo and Lo'i restoration, Mm -hmm. which is the wetland form of farming Kalo or taro. Mm-hmm. And not more importantly, but but the emphasis prior to Lo'i restoration was actually revitalizing the practice of Kui'ai and Kui'ikalo, which was the pounding of, of taro into Pa'i'ai and the Hawaiian you know, delicacy of poi mm. and the, all of the implements used in that practice. And so we've aligned you know, our apprenticeships into that work and, and our learning continuum into that work and our, and our philosophy. Mm. into that work as well. And yes, most recently branching out into culinary. Mm. Wow. That's just so, it's so magic. (laughs) It's so magic because, you know, you can just imagine that our listeners are thinking, okay, so this starts as a, you know, kind of as a program where kids were working with Rick to build and we're talking about Woodshop. And then, you know, slowly but surely Hana Builds becomes literally Hana Builds. It's like (laughs) you're adding on layer after layer after layer. And I think anybody listening would understand that layering is a really important part of this entire story of you, of the program, of Hana, of everything, right? It's just multiple, multiple layers. And then So I'm going to add another layer here, which is, sure. (laughs) so for our listeners in the other 49 states, I want to dig into the concept of pono. So Mary Kavana Pukui's Dictionary of Hawaiian Words provides multiple definitions of pono, including goodness, uprightness, moral qualities, correct or proper procedure, virtue, and fairness, among others. So let's imagine Lipoa, you are speaking to an audience of makerspace educators gathered in Santa Barbara at a conference, and all of them are focused on skill building. And you are a keynote speaker. What is the importance of bringing ethics and goodness and morality and pono into the concept of in work there is learning? And how does Makahana Kaike go about doing that? That is a nice layered question. (laughs) And no pressure. No pressure. You're up on the podium. (laughs) Here's the mic. But I haven't even been able to think about what I'm going to say. No, but Pono and ethics. You know, I've even just thinking on the podcast that you shared with me with Mm. Don O'Donohue Mm -hmm. is another great example of, I mean, just being able to use conversations of beauty use poetry to speak to and and hopefully right the hope is to influence the ways of businesses and corporations mm. and i i do feel fortunate that even though my time as an executive director is short mm. i'm still at the beginning i feel like mm-hmm. <laughs> i i've been blessed to have opportunities with deep thinkers yeah. and and deep doers like the late Uncle Pono Shim and Auntie Puanani Burgess, and then also my own Kumu here mm-hmm. that, yeah, and ask us to request of us, you know, and almost make it feel like it's our duty to utilize these moments of pause, yeah. but deep reflection in our work, you know, and, and again, we're, we're fortunate to be in the nonprofit sphere where I think there's, it feels like at least, there's more flexibility and openness to do that. Mm. So 
jumping back to the, you know, the scene that you so eloquently said, <laughs> I'm not speaking to, you know, that to others, you know, maybe in the nonprofit sphere, but, right. but in the realm of education, you know, what, what is Pono and what is the importance of ethics is I think tapping into this idea of, like you were saying, building that, yes, our, our youth, we want our youth to have these skills. We want them to know how to read and write and do, you know, a certain level of equations. But the beauty comes from creating young people that have confidence, that trust, that are open, and that can problem solve. And I do believe that the ways in which Makahana is doing that is because we have that hands-on. We couple our service with the hands-on mm. aspect where you know our youth want to see something come to life. Right. They want to see a result. There mm. is that visual. And for some, it's going to be that reward. It's going to be that award. It's going to be that scholarship. It's going to be that essay on which, you know, is a big, beautiful A, B, A plus. <laughs> yeah. And for others, they're going to want to see that final product. Yeah. And in Makahana, you know, thanks to Rick and the way that he molded us to think outside of the box and that we can, and that when we do look at what we've created, mm. we've built a house in which Auntie can come back to. Yeah, right. Or Uncle can come back to yeah. after coming home in a wheelchair. You know, here's the railing that allows Tutu to mm. be able to live out her days here mm. with her family, which might have been family to some of the participants in the program. You know, here's the food that we're able to provide to our community, you know, both in times of need, but also on a regular basis. Yeah. You know, here's the papa, the the board on which we kui or pound food, you know, that we're able to gift to to another. And that's the idea of pono, pono being righteousness, but also mm. reciprocity. Not yes. that there needs to be a give and take, but when we give, we're also being given yeah. this beautiful moment of confidence, yeah. of building capacity, of problem solving, right? I created this thing for another that will provide for them and their family for generations. And in return, I'm receiving confidence mm. and, and beauty mm. and... Of course, I'd polish it up a little bit more. Of course, but of course. Yeah. <laughs> if I was in front of an audience, but but thank you for that question and thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs> I I think that's fantastic. I think over time, you know, the seven years that I've been involved in this process of reimagining education, I've watched people jump on bandwagons more often than not. And I think one of the bandwagons, and it's there's no disrespect in this. It's just like something happens, and people are like they, they get very excited about it. And the maker space, you know, robotics, all of that kind of stuff is terrific. And I love, love, love the fact that the kids are getting an opportunity to make and build and to design, especially and do all of that. But mm -hmm. the message that you just delivered, and that was fantastic because you did not know what was coming in that moment is that we want to think deeply about whatever it is that you're making. Does it have a benefit to somebody else? Does it bring a better life to somebody else? And I think back, Lipoa, to many of our listeners have seen Ted Dindersmith's film, Most Likely to Succeed. And, you know, the result of that film at the end is the big wheel where, you know, the kids mm -hmm. are doing a mechanical representation of the rise and fall of civilizations. But I've heard that at High Tech High in San Diego, the big wheel has been moved away from the lobby and into a back room because mm. they kind of came to the conclusion that that actually didn't benefit the community in any significant way. And that I love the idea uh -huh. that people are starting to think about, well, if we're going to be making this stuff, in what ways does it actually help somebody's life? Like, you know, a ramp up to the house or whatever it is, right? And I think I'm just so encouraged that we're starting mm -hmm. to think about that. And that's why, you know, I was really focused on that concept of Pono. And it sounds like that Makahanaka Ike has moved deliberately in that direction over the years of ensuring that Rick's vision from the beginning was that whatever we were going to do, whatever we we're going to make or grow or cook or whatever, it was going to have some benefit to the community, right? Is that, am I on the right track? Indeed, yeah, and it's it's amazing how naturally each phase of our becoming occurred, and it was always, you know, 
yes, it, it was able to utilize the, you know, Rick's original vision of Makahana Kaike, but it, it always left room for the vision of someone else and the passion of someone else. And, and so with each program's beginning, there was someone else that was able to come in and provide their passion and vision. And I think some of their, their true work. Mm. And that's how, you know, that's Mahele Farm, Malamahaloa, and now Culinary. There were people that joined, you know, the efforts that fortunately are still here. <laughs> mm-hmm. And... And we're able to take it to new heights. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's awesome. We are going to take a break. Everybody stay with us. We'll be back in a minute with more questions for Lipoa Kahale Uahi. We'll be right back. Stay with us. This is Guy Kawasaki. If you want to learn how to be a remarkable person, please check out my podcast, Remarkable People. I interview people like Roy Yamaguchi, Margaret Atwood, Jane Goodall, Stephen Wolfram, Stephen Pinker, Ariana Huffington, and Steve Wozniak. The point of the podcast is to help you become a little bit more remarkable. To learn more, go to remarkablepeople.com. Thank you. Aloha, my name is Aaron Shorn, a previous guest on this very podcast. I am also now head of growth and community at Hawaii's own Unruler. Unruler is a collaborative mobile and web platform that accelerates innovation, grows culture and community, and celebrates learning. Learners post multimedia, tag their learning, and through comments are able to work together asynchronously. Each post is a moment of learning that forms the foundation of a joyous learning journey. We can be found at UNR. ULR.com. Mahalo. Hey everyone, we are back with Lipoa Kahale Uahi, competitive surfer, lifelong learner, and the executive director of Makahana Kaike, an award winning experiential learning program in East Maui. So, Lipoa, our listeners are aware of, many of them, of the five themes of the What School Could Be Innovation Playlist. They are mobilizing your community, student-driven learning, real-world challenges, deeper learning assessments, and caring and connected communities. So your Makahana Kaike Ho'o Mohala 2020 pivot, I think, is a mm-hmm. classic example of why <laughs> we feel these are such important themes. So what is the story of this pivot and how did the five themes more or less come into play? Ho'omohala, it was started largely to continue having work for our employees and, and our employees begin at as student apprentices. And so those are students that are in high school or or have turned 14. And so some 14-year-olds are still in eighth grade or just coming out of eighth grade. But at the start of 14 to 18, you can work with Makahana Kaike in any one of our three programs now. Four. Four. And from there, once you've graduated from high school and you want to continue your skill building and learning and work with Makahana, you become a graduate apprentice. So again, our programs has a unit of graduate apprentices that work in our day-to-day operations. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you know, roughly anywhere from one to four years, sometimes a graduate apprentice stays on. And if they continue and want to, you know, continue their skills, but also have gained a level of professionalism, they can become graduate teachers. And then from there, you know, there can be other professional development, other learning of skills and giving back to the community. And there may be other positions, you know, in in program manager, program assistant, you know, even administrative positions that might, you know, this person might want to Mm. enter into. And so that's how we've naturally built capacity Mm. in Mahana. Mm -hmm. And so Ho'omohala, you know, was March of 2020 or April of 2020. Yeah, the big moment (laughs) for everybody, right? Yeah, (laughs) The big moment, exactly, where we're just like, what are we going to do? Yeah, You know, we're, we're still in our small, tight-knit community. 
I'm forgetting now when our, our roads were shut off from outside traffic, but mm-hmm. that happened. And, mm-hmm. and so how are we going to take care of ourselves? And it, it's not so much as, I mean, we like to pride ourselves here that if it happened, we'd be ready. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, you know, if the barges stop coming, if the ships stop coming, since we do get a lot of produce and things imported, what's going to happen? Well, mm. we feel pretty confident mm, right. <laughs> that we'll be okay. Yeah. So that, you know, in some sense that happened. And, and so, you know, I just preface that because, you know, we're just, I'm just asking that we were just asking that as like, you know, an employer and, and not wanting to put our families and our employees into any more additional hardship. And so how are we, how, are, what are we going to do? How are we going to continue employing them? Being that fortunately, we still had funding to keep our doors open. So of course, Mm. that's a critical point where we had fundraised enough. And fortunately, a lot of funders at that time were, you know, some did sunset, some did, you know, close their doors for the time being because Mm. their businesses were shut down and they weren't able to provide funding. Mm. But there were others that became extreme, like more flexible in in Mm. accepting applications and awarding funding. And so there was a wide range of, of that response. But fortunately, we we were in the green zone. We were in an area where we could continue to keep our doors open and, and our payroll going. Mm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and so that put us into that, you know, again, a fortunate state of being where we were asking the question, how can we continue employing our people from home when, mm, yeah. you know, yes, like administratively, there's you know, in many ways, there's a constant flow of work. But of course, the other majority is our programmatic work. Yeah. And, and so how can we keep our lo'i restored? How can we keep, you know, the, the kalo growing well? How can we keep our produce growing? And so not only did we create alternative schedules to provide that, you know, those constant check-ins to continue farming and doing that kind of hands-on work, but for a quick period of time, in that time of, you know, more isolation, we encouraged our employees, how can you just help your family stay well in this time? How can you help sustain your family in this time of Mm. challenge Mm. and change? Wow. And suddenly being able to become kind of the recipient of all this work that they're they're constantly doing for others. Yeah. That was the essential question wow. <laughs> to put it in, you know, teacher terms. Right, that was the right. essential question yeah. that everyone was asked. And so you were able to propose, well, I'm gonna plant a garden for my family. My family never has a garden because I'm, you know, constantly maintaining a garden for others. And that's able to provide for others that I don't or, or some of our building program, right? Who who build, we're now able to kind of switch gears and say, oh, I'm gonna actually plant for my family, you know, and, and utilize those skills and learn those skills and practice that. And so they were first able to propose their own work. Mm, and wow. with our program managers, you know, we were able to just kind of hold, you know, create some accountability, of course, because we're not checking in on everybody, yeah, good. but checking in with how, okay, you know, with someone's timesheet, how much, you know, like, I mean, not wanting to create limitations, but just a sense of accountability. So that was there, you know, double checking time and making sure that that amount of time to create a mala was realistic Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) and various check-ins with program managers. And then, you know, weekly meetings via via Zoom or Google Meets. (laughs) Yeah. And from there, Ho'omohala was born. And Mohala is the unfurling leaf, mm. particularly of the kalo plant. So when you, if you know taro, if you know kalo, but, but it's also, mohala is also used so often in that new shoot of mm. many plants wow. that is just unfurling. And, and so the idea was that we could, you know, together kind of make and create this unfurling in our families, you know, and then eventually as we, you know, things started to open up, whether it's, you know, going back to school in a measured way Mm -hmm. in person, you know, we, our school did that with elementary first and we were able to at least check in or or invite students, you know, with precautions into some of our activities. We were able to expand out to, to serve more Mm -hmm. students and their families with this initiative. Mm. And so they were asked the same questions, you know, how can you first give back to your family? And they proposed a project and then eventually it expanded a little bit more to how can you help sustain your community? Mm. Wow. 
So again, you know, <laughs> magic in the sense that I've spoken with so many people over the last couple of years who went through what we all call pandemic pivots, right? Mm -hmm. And and that in in so many ways, well, first of all, what really jumps out is confidence and capacity, right? <laughs> Instead of being pushed down and ground down by the pandemic, you actually grew your confidence and your capacity as an organization and all of the people oh, in it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other part is that that endures because now you have kind of different complexities to your program because you're capable, you have that capacity of that diffusion that the work that you're doing, the culinary work, the agriculture work, the building work, the internal pono work, all of that can happen all over Hana. It can actually happen elsewhere. And I think, Lipoa, what has mm. really jumped out at me over the course of the couple weeks of preparing for today is that it's almost difficult to say that the program is for troubled youth. I just don't buy that mm. anymore. I think yeah. what you're doing as a program, Makahana Kaiki becomes a demonstration of what all schools could be in many mm. ways. And uh, that that's really the moment that we've arrived at right now. Yeah, And so it's almost mm -hmm. like individualized development has now become a part of the DNA of your program because everybody had to lock down and figure out what they were going to be doing in their own space. And I, I think I'm reading that right. Does that feel right to you? Yeah, sure. I mean, we things have definitely sped back up, as I'm sure many yeah. you know, listeners are are feeling, but but definitely. Yeah. So we have one more question for you. But before we do, I just want to go back for a second and and note to our listeners that you referenced a podcast episode that the two of us listened to before today. It's actually John O'Donohue, and it's an On Being podcast, which I love, by the way. Shout out mm -hmm. to listeners. That that's one of my favorite podcasts. And this episode was called The Inner Landscape of Beauty. And about halfway through, O'Donohue, who's a poet, an Irish poet, obviously, goes on a riff about being stuck in the wrong kind of work and about the loveliness of someone who is doing exactly what they want to be doing. And I, I love that you brought it up, and I love that one of the things that's coming out in this entire conversation is that Makahana Kaike is working towards that, towards all of the participants being able to look at the work that they're doing and love it for the vitality that it brings to their lives. Mm. And I think a big part of that, which has come through in this conversation, is that this is not just work for the sake of work, it's work for the sake of others, of building for others, of making others' lives better, whether it's a, a house or or a garden or a program or, or a cooking event or something like that. It's all in the service of the community, right? So I just wanted to make sure that our listeners know about that. And I'm glad that you brought that up. So that brings me to just this last question today, Lipoa. So my father, it's actually about surfing again. We're going to return to this, right? <laughs> perfect. Yes, perfect. So my father actually forbade me and my brothers from board surfing. So when we were growing up, so I suspect he thought it was some sort of devil's work and we would all become slackers, you know. Mm. But strangely enough, though, he did not forbid body surfing, which we all did practically every mm. day. So what was he thinking, right? So <laughs> anyway, I found a tweet from the 1st of May in 2017 by an account called Sumatran Surf. And the photo attached to the tweet shows you emerging from a tube <laughs> on an epic wave. And the tweet says, I quote, focus on the light at the end of the tunnel. And your Instagram handle, limu underscore lipoa, is tagged. So I don't even know how to ask this question, but I wonder if you can reflect on the ways this tweet's words about emerging or focusing on the light at the end of the tunnel ring true in your life. How do those words, you know, help us to understand you and the meaning of your life? I can picture that, not only the picture, but so I'm glad, I'm glad I know the picture because mm -hmm. <laughs> it does bring forth, you know, a set of images and emotions, mm. you know, from around that time and that moment. But the light at the end of the tunnel leading up to returning home to Hana, mm. 
mm. as I did spend 10 years, yeah, 10 years mm -hmm. away. That was always the light at the end of the tunnel. Mm. But there was all, you know, was returning at some point. Wow. And, and I kind of give myself sometimes a hard time because, you know, I didn't say return home to be a doctor or yeah. return home to, you know, be, be this or be that, you know, to provide for your people and your place, you know, in this way. And mm. I'm like, ah, oh, if only <laughs> yeah. I'd been more specific, but at the same time, that's not how I am. That's mm -hmm. not how I was. And that's not, you know, what I was meant to do. And so that image is, is quite literal, but in the, in the sense that again, when I, like I described that moment of a barrel, riding a barrel, being in a barrel earlier, it, it's so literally the, the light at the end of the tunnel is getting out. And I think for so long, right. That was the idea was to get out, to get yeah. away, to go elsewhere. Mm. And as As soon as I left, and I always knew that I wanted to return home, but it's so funny how that image and that focus shift changed. I did a 180, 360. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I completely switched to where, you know, so much of what I did out there was with the idea and the focus with the light at the end of the tunnel being here mm. and being back here in whatever way that I was meant to do at that time. And, and it took a while, you know, it wasn't like at every turn I was like, Oh, how do I get home? It was like, no, I, I didn't want to, I need, I knew I needed to learn more and become more and be elsewhere. And I wanted, you know, there was still that desire of being elsewhere, mm. but I knew eventually at some time I want to return home. And I knew that that was the purpose mm. of everything out there <laughs> mm -hmm. was to come back here not just, you know, come back for a vacation and, which I, of course, did, but to come back and be and, and be here and to give back. And, you know, it, it's here now. And, you know, of course, there are challenges. And, but I'm able to, I mean, reflect on moments like that, you know, like that image mm, <laughs> on yeah. social media, you yeah. know, that, that are like, I, I was out there and now I'm here, mm. you know, and, and that's beautiful. And so I appreciate that. Yeah. I think what jumps out at me is just the notion of coming back with an open mind and an open heart that you weren't coming mm -hmm. back as a person like a doctor or something mm -hmm. like that. <laughs> you were coming back as a child of Hana that had been raised by the village, which included everything, the land and all the people and everything there. And you were open to the idea of how that would unfold. And I think if I've heard this story from Rick correctly, Rick Ruiz, that that's what put you in a position when he was like, hey, I want to hire you. And you're like, for what? <laughs> and he's like, I don't care. I just want to hire you. That you were open to that moment and realizing that you were home. Right. And that yes. there's always that next barrel and that next light at the end of the tunnel. And you just keep working through it because that's who you are. And I think that's awesome. So Lipoa, thank you for taking the time to be on the What School Could Be podcast today. Appreciate you. And I hope everybody in the HANA community stays safe and in good health. And we wish you the very best as you move forward with Makahana Kaike in the months and years to come. Mahalo nui yaka ko. Mahalo Uncle Josh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll see you soon. Aloha. My editor, creative consultant, and sound engineer is the talented Evan Kurahara. Our theme music comes from the vast catalog of music created by my friend of 40 years, the remarkable pianist Michael Sloan. Producer of 12 albums with over 100 songs, Michael Sloan is featured in Apple Music, Spotify, and all the major music platforms. You can also find his work at his YouTube channel. Michael has listeners in over 100 countries and over 2,000 cities to date. Support these episodes with remarkable, innovative, and imaginative educators and education leaders by giving us your own rating and writing us a review at your favorite podcast store. This series is sponsored by education change agent Ted Dintersmith, executive producer of the acclaimed documentary film Most Likely to Succeed, and author of the best-selling book, What School Could Be. 
please join the What School Could Be global online community by going to community.whatschoolcouldbe.org or by downloading the What School Could Be app from your favorite app store. The What School Could Be podcast is brought to you by Josh Rapoon Productions. Send your feedback to josh at whatschoolcouldbe.org. Follow us on Twitter at WSCB Podcast or at Josh Rapoon. Friends, even as COVID infection numbers decline, stay safe and please get vaccinated. Most of all, bring kindness and compassion into the world. We need a surplus of both right now. Until the next episode, ahui ho and take care. <laughs>